Uh, so thank you all for attending tonight's panel. I'm so incredibly excited and honored to host tonight's webinar as both of our panelists are not only incredibly accomplished athletes having reached the highest level in our sport, but tremendous people using their talents to make lasting impacts. Bumi Jima was a finalist in the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, the long jump. She was also a member of the 2009, 2011, and 2013 World Championship team for the United States. In 2015, Bumi Jima was inducted into the Hall of Fame of her alma mater. She served as assistant track coach at Rice University for three seasons, two for the women and one for the men. She remains involved in sports performance training on a contract basis, and she currently co-owns a medical legal firm serving as the vice president of business development. USATF New England's own Sean Fury represented the U.S. in the javelin throw at the 2012 London and 2016 Rio de Janeiro Olympics, as well as at the World Championships in 2009 and 2015, and on the Pan American Championship team in 2011 and 2015. A 2004 graduate of Dartmouth College, he is currently the lead mechanical engineer at Raytheon. He also leads a javelin training group and is a member of USATF New England's Board of Directors. Thank you both for taking the time to share your incredible journey and wisdom with us. We look forward to learning from you. Our first set of questions tonight is on your journey to the Olympics and World Championships. So we would love to know how did you get started in track and fields and what advice would you have for a young athlete who is just beginning the sport? Go ahead, you can go first, Sean, I'll follow you up. Okay, sure. Yeah, so uh, mine was pretty easy. I, my first love was football. Uh, so the football coach was also the track coach. He said, everyone who was on the football team, you're on the track team now. <laughs> um, so I was a quarterback, I could always throw stuff. So javelin um, was a pretty natural transition. You know, I also love to run the hurdles and, and uh, pole vault and do all kinds of things. Uh, I was really terrible when I was a freshman in high school. I was like five, six, 99 pounds. Um, and I ran 24 seconds in the 110 hurdles. So for, for reference, that's, that's pretty bad. So, so my advice for, for young, young people is to stick with it because you never know what's going to happen. You may not grow a foot and gain 100 pounds, um, but you can, you can gain skill and you can just enjoy the process of, of growing and chasing new personal best. Also, I think everyone would agree that, you know, all your best friends are going to come from the track team. Um, it's an excellent uh, bonding experience. Um, so I'm friends with, you know, people all the way down to my, my high school team. Uh, so it, it's a great sport. For me. <laughs> so I got started in track and field. I grew up in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And in my mind at that time, that was Track Town USA, as far as I was concerned, uh, we had an amazing amount of uh, excellent athletes in track and field and also just all sports really um, at University of Arkansas where my mom was a professor at that time. Um, I went to my first track camp hosted by the University of Arkansas and I fell in love. And at that time I was very gung ho about being a high jumper. And I ended up being state champion in the high jump in Arkansas and just uh, was able to attend some indoor track meets. I fell in love with indoor track probably pretty early and the track was about a five minute walk from my house. So I would go down there um, and uh, I, I was good at it. I played basketball too, but I was good at it. And so, you know, you wanna keep on doing things that you were good at. I ended up having some pretty good mentors who would come from the university to uh, my junior high school at that time, Ramey Junior High, and talk to us, help coach us. Like I was getting some excellent tutelage at a pretty young age. So I really fell in love with it and I saw how I could be successful in it. And I just kind of took it from there. And then I realized I was good at other things. So I wasn't just a good high jumper. Um, I ended up being a pretty decent sprinter, pretty decent hurdler. Um, and then kind of even got into the long jump pretty late. <laughs> but um, that was my entree kind of into track and field. And as far as advice for younger athletes, I would say, you know, <clears throat> I, I loved it. So if, if you love track and field, um, I don't think it's really, I don't think it'll be a, a hard thing to, you know, get the work in. I wanted to go to the track on a regular basis. It was a different time. So I could just walk from my house to the track, 
work out by myself, get some workouts in, watch, observe, learn, read. Um, I used to go and like look up video of older athletes, um, athletes of the past, like do your history. I think it's probably one of the best things because sometimes I coach young kids and I'm like, do you know such and such? <laughs> and they don't know someone who I feel like they should know, you know? And I'm just like, well, you know, watch other people, uh, read about other people, read about your sport and it'll bring you closer to it. Um, and I think that that would be really helpful for young athletes. So that would be my advice, be a student. Yeah, thank you both uh, so much for sharing those early steps on your journey. Um, thinking a little bit further down the road, how did your high school and collegiate careers prepare you for the Olympics? And when in your athletic career did you know that becoming an Olympian was possible for you? Hmm. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, my, so I, again, growing up in Fayetteville, people were not just okay at sport. They were excellent at sport. So being okay just didn't even seem like an option. Um, so I knew that I wanted to be on that high of a level in my journal, which I wrote in religiously at 10 years old. I said, I want to go to the Olympics. And I really meant it. Like I saw it on TV and I was like, this is where I want to be. And this is what I want to do. Um, so I'd say the athletes who were around me, uh, in high school helped prepare me for the next steps, would have, which would have been university. And then the athletes that I was competing against at the university level, you know, their competitiveness really helped me. My first coach at Rice was Victor Lopez, who is in my mind, hands down, one of the best coaches I've ever met. And um, he let me know that my competition was not at Rice. My competition was not in NCAA. My competition was on a world stage. And he told me that from day one. So I wasn't concerned about just being good in my small circle. I was concerned about being good on an international level. Um, and when you start thinking like that, then you are thinking towards Olympic games. And then once I even found out what world championships was, because I didn't know what it was, <laughs> um, then you start thinking towards things like that. So I was constantly surrounded by people who had loftier goals than I even could imagine. So you have no choice but to fall in line. And I did. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I think I didn't have the same, same experience. I came from a pretty small town. Nobody really knew anything about, about anything, but I had was blessed with awesome high school coach. My football coach was the most influential coach I've had. And he really set me up with good habits uh, for, for any endeavor going forward, whether it was, you know, warming up, cooling down, how to pack for me, just the fundamentals um, of how to carry yourself as someone who's trying to be professional at whatever they're doing. And that helped, you know, help, help me with, you know, my, my career longevity. So I didn't graduate college um, you know, at the international level, I was barely at the national level, but it took me 10 years um, to get to where I was to be competing in the Olympics. And I think, you know, that was attributed to, you know, the, the habits that were instilled in me early uh, by my high school coach. And then the same thing happened in college where I went to, uh, to Dartmouth and Carl Wallen is an amazing coach, uh, maybe not the well known for his uh, being a javelin technician, but again, you know, teaching me how to take it to the next level in terms of preparation and attention to detail. Uh, so I think those habits what uh, what really uh, helped propel me. And in terms of when I knew I was going to be an Olympian, or in, when I uh, decided that was a goal, uh, the javelin kind of chooses you. I think you meet most javelin throwers and they're all a little bit crazy, and they all just want to throw farther. So I had a little bit of success when I was a junior at, in Massachusetts in high school. I threw uh, threw a big personal best in the state meet my junior year and, and won. And then I think from that point I was hooked. I was like, oh wow, this feels good. I was like, I'm going to throw, I'm going to be the national champion next year. And then after that, I'm going to be the NCAA champion and I'm going to throw 300 feet. And that was like a dream from the beginning. And I kind of stuck with it until it, uh, until it happened. Yeah. You know, thank you uh, both for sharing those stories of how the Olympics became a possibility for you. Um, I'm very curious to know as you um, progressed um, from an early athlete up to the highest level in our sport, what the best piece of advice you received was? Mm. <laughs> I, I have to think for a moment. Um, I can, uh, Fumi, I can go first. I think I have yeah, a good one. 
So, uh, you know, my favorite piece of advice was something that I read that Jan Zelezny, the world record holder, uh, wrote. So I was kind of like Fumi where I was, I call myself like a, an archaeologist. So all these old athletes and, and coaches, I can tell them like what they said or what they wrote about or what they were interviewed about. I was always digging stuff up. And it, it frustrates me too when, when young athletes don't, don't have that. But I read an article from Jan Zelezny and he was like, uh, you have to set your life up to achieve the goals that you want. And I really took that to heart. Uh, so you know, whether it's moving across the country, whether it's, you know, sacrificing your career for, for a moment uh, to go where you need to go to achieve what you want to do, um, that, that really hit home. And I made sure to, uh, to establish a situation that was going to get me to the Olympic Games. And it took, you know, me moving from Massachusetts to San Diego, you know, working part time in my career uh, and, and really putting a lot of things on the back burner, and turn, and including, you know, my 20s and 30s. Uh, uh, to, to really focus on that. So uh, I think that was, that really, you know, helped me get to the next level. Mm. Um, I can't really think of a bit of advice that I received, um, but I would say a bit of a, a advice that I somehow came upon was following uh, reading the book, Relax and Win by Bud Winter, one of my favorites. And it it was something that I carried with me going forward and also try to impart upon young athletes. Um, I, I'm a very high strung person. <laughs> um, and that book really it helped me understand that you can't be effective if you're not relaxed. And it seems so counter to doing such ballistic things or executing a lot of force. It seems counterintuitive, but it's not. And that is one of the best things that I learned. Um, and it's invite advice that I now give um, is to relax and win. It it really to me is the key, you know, you have to and then because being relaxed is difficult sometimes. So if you get to the point where you know you're relaxed and you can execute, you're about to do something great. Yeah, thank you uh, both for sharing that advice. And I'm sure um, for many of our um, listeners, those will be things that they uh, think about in their own athletic pursuits. Um, so now I want to zoom in a little bit on what it is like um, to be one of the top athletes in the world at your events. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what a typical week of training looked like for you as a world-class athlete? Um, I'll go ahead and go. Um, my week was pretty standard. Um, on Mondays, I knew I was going to be sprinting. On Tuesdays, I knew I was going to be, you know, lifting and doing some kind of power, some type of, some type of explosiveness. On Wednesday, I knew I was going to have, you know, a semi recovery day. And then Thursday, and Friday looked similar to Monday and Tuesday. And I worked out every single Saturday of my entire career if I didn't have a track meet ever, every single Saturday. So I always had a Saturday morning workout, which was usually technique, um, any kind of cleanup stuff that I didn't get done during the week or something I needed to refocus on. I will say that I did train at a few different places. So at the Olympic Training Center, the program was rather similar, but um, maybe there were more days of strength. And when I trained at IMG, there was more days of recovery. <laughs> um, but other than that, that was what my typical week would look like. And then Sundays were supposed to be active rest, but I did not do active rest. I rest rested. I was like, you'll have to peel me out of this bed rest. Um, but I trained Monday through Saturday, pretty much for the, my entire career. Nice. Yeah, I was going to use the same word peel in my off day with Saturday where you could peel me off the couch. Uh, yeah, so my uh, my training setup was was somewhat similar. Uh, so I would have big training days on Sunday, Tuesday and Thursday, where I would typically have like a three hour session in the morning where I would do throws, jumps and sprints and then eat a big lunch, take a nap and uh, lift weights in the afternoon. And then on Mondays and Fridays. I'd have a, a single session where you focus on, you know, tempo running, maybe some more weightlifting and some core work or gymnastics. And then Wednesday was like recovery with, with uh, yoga and things like that. I had the training center. It was amazing. We had beautiful facilities. Um, 
and we had plenty of recovery modalities. So chiropractors, massage, all of that kind of stuff. So you could fill your day with that. Uh, um, I know, I think you, you may have some, some questions about that later, so I won't go too much into that now. Uh, but added into that, I had a part-time job. So the full-time, you know, I was working between 20 and 30 hours a week as a mechanical engineer. So on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, those were my work days. I was working part-time. So I'd have to, uh, you know, work and then, uh, then go to my training. But it was, uh, it was a great, you, your entire week is just prioritized around, around training and recovering. And like Fumi, Saturday, Saturday is my day off and it was uh, eat and sleep. I was usually uh, yeah. too poor to walk. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, thank you uh, for sharing that. So Sean, I know you touched upon the concept of recovery and that is an idea we are definitely trying to hit home with our program um, because in order to reach one's potential as an athlete, um, not only have to put in huge volumes of work, um, but also let your body recover. Um, so I'm curious as to if you could both comment on some of the ways that you recovered in between training sessions, um, whether it be physical recovery, mental recovery, um, something at the training center, um, something otherwise, but I'd love to hear more about that. Oh my gosh, recovery. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and that I, I had a pretty long career. So recovery got even more important towards the end when I was in my early thirties. Um, but recovery for me was so serious. I am not an ice bath person. I've probably taken five in my entire life. I don't care what anyone says. I think that it is torture, but I understand the benefits of it. So I would do it occasionally, but lots of ice, just not ice baths, um, always prepared myself. So preparation was as important for as recovery. So I would do, you know, the heat and stuff as, um, you know, preparation for training. I got a lot of, we had excellent, excellent services while we were at the Olympic Training Center. So I would get acupuncture like once a week. Um, I would get chiropractic at least once a week as well when I was there and even when I was training in Houston. And it was necessary um, as a jumper, honestly, any athlete, but as a jumper, the amount of compression that you get on your body, you really do need to see a chiropractor to keep those things together. Together. Not only that, I was doing PT for some of the weaknesses I had in my body that they identified when I had when I was at the training center. Um, a lot of specific oblique work, a lot of specific like hip work, um, which honestly some days was just so tedious. But I totally knew the benefit of it. But it felt so tedious, and I was like this is the hardest part of training was the recovery. Those, th those days were the recovery. Cause I was like, I just want to sleep, but I know this is what's going to make me better. Right. Um, and then in addition to some of those physical modalities that we had for recovery, um, sports psych became something actually that's not true. Sports psych was always something that was important to me, but not as much did I delve into it until later into my career. And um, I was provided those services at the Olympic Training Center, but also through USATF as well. Um, and I really appreciated that um, because sometimes if you're finding difficulties on the track, it might not be physical at all. It might be happening between your ears and you know you can help yourself or get help in those, in those ways as well. Um, so besides that, the other thing was sleep. And I was a participant in a sleep study uh, when I was at the Olympic Training Center as well. So um, I was really cognizant of my sleep because that's where you're going to get some of your best recovery. I love routine. Um, I flourished with the routine there. Even to this day, I have a very similar routine that I did when I was training. But that um, sleep recovery and just being aware of how you're sleeping, how well you're sleeping, what quality of sleep you're getting was very important to me. And, um, I saw the benefit of the last part of recovery is nutrition, um, and making sure that you're recovering with the appropriate foods. And, uh, again, at the training center, I had that, I learned a lot about my nutrition and, uh, I take that with me going forward and I impart it, you know, to the athletes that I work with now. Recovery is so multifaceted and that's why being a great athlete can be time consuming <laughs> because all of those things that I named take so a lot of time out of your day, you know, and as a professional, you know, it makes it, it's fine because that's your job. But, you know, if, if, you know, if you're not a professional, you don't have that time, you do have to 
prioritize some of those different modalities. Um, and of course, it can get very expensive as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's the, the long list of things that I use for recovery. Sean, I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> you didn't leave anything for me. Sorry, uh, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, great job. So <laughs> I think, you know, I was uh, like Fumi, very lucky to be at the Olympic Training Center. And, and the way that I took advantage of, of all of those modalities was creating a, a structure. So I knew, you know, on Mondays would be when I did ice bath and saw the chiropractor or Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, I would do that. Actually, you know, every day was ice bath, but I had chiropractor days. I'd have, you know, multiple hours of massages scheduled. So every week, just like my training sessions, my recovery sessions were already planned in. So I didn't really have to think about it. Also, you know, at the beginning, I think Fumi touched on this, but at the beginning of the season and then periodically throughout, you know, we would be assessed. We would go through functional movement screens or other type of screens to identify, you know, where are your imbalances? Are you developing any new? Are you fixing the old ones? And that drove the rehabilitation or the preventative exercises you do. So you have that pre-programmed. Um, you have, you know, your sports psychology sessions. I was able to have those, you know, once or twice a week. I see the nutritionist every month. Um, so it, it was awesome to just have that planned into your, into your, uh, into your daily routine so that you're working just as hard on your recovery as you are on your, uh, on your training. Uh, and then I think to throw it in there, you need to have some weeks where you just go to Wendy's and order everything on the menu. Uh, yeah. and then maybe don't get out of bed for a couple of days, or you go out with your friends and you stay w out way too late, uh, to reset that, right. You can only stay mentally focused so long and feeling like, garbage uh, for a little while with some bad diet and maybe not enough sleep for a couple of days, as long as you have enough time to recover and you don't do it, you know, right before the world championships, it's going to help you in the long run. So taking one tiny step back to reset your mind and refocus you, uh, that helped me a lot. You know, sometimes you feel like you're about to cry. If you have to go through one more discipline a week, you need to give yourself. A break. Yeah. So thank you both uh, for sharing so much about recovery. Um, as both of you spoke, I, I think uh, pretty much nothing was uh, left unsaid, which is awesome um, because I think so much time goes into what we do in training and how to use your training to optimize your results and your health and performance. Um, but equally important um, is understanding that training breaks your body down a little bit and you have to give your body a chance to adapt and recover and you both made that incredibly clear. Um, so I know you both um, at a few points mentioned the Olympic Training Center and also that you trained in a few other places. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about where you trained um, post-college and if there were any differences in places you trained or anything in particular that you learned from or benefited from um, training in different places. Yeah. Um, so when I, I graduated university in 2007 and I, um, I made the Olympic team in 2008, my very first year of training, um, I was working at what used to be called UT Pan American, which is now called UT Rio Grande Valley. It's in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. And, um, I trained by myself. Um, it was me. I would coach, I would wake up and I train at like six o'clock in the morning. I'd coach, I'd do the other administrative stuff. And then I, you know, work out again in the evening. I was not having the ability to be as, um, as uh, structured as I would have liked because, you know, I was working. So that was a little odd. But then following that, I made the Olympic team. I was able to move back to Houston and I trained at Rice with my collegiate coach um, from 2008 until um, 2000 and well, until two, the end of 2009 or the beginning of 2009. And then at that time, right before the world championships in Berlin, I went to go train with Eric Drexler, who is, um, or he was the coach and father-in-law of Heike Drexler, who was, um, an excellent long jumper in Germany. So I lived in Germany and, uh, trained with my German coach who did not speak English, but spoke Russian and German. And it was fantastic. I loved it. And I learned a lot. And um, the training methodology was very different from uh, what I was used to. And uh, I had to adapt to that, but we didn't use a lot of gadgets and toys and things like that. It was just 
very straightforward training. After that, I went to the Olympic Training Center in 2011 through 2012, where the training program was a little bit different. Again, there, very strength-based for me, as opposed to kind of technique-based as I was you know, used to before and had to adapt to that, got to work with a lot of different gadgets and tools and had, you know, as we discussed earlier, a plethora of, you know, support from all different places. And then um, I ended up getting a little homesick and I went back home <laughs> and I stayed in Houston from 2012 until the fall of 2000 or 2015. Um, and I went back to my regular routine, my university coach, all of that. And then my last year, I was like, let me make a change 2015 to 2016. And I went to IMG and I trained there. And uh, that was probably some of the best training I had because it was the first time I really had like a good group of other athletes that I was training with. Um, and that was a very structured, very competitive group, which I think was really good. And I didn't have almost for most of my career um, was a competitive group to work with. Most of my work was done solo. So I've had a lot of different training experiences. And because I've had a lot of training experiences, at least for me, I feel like I can say what worked and what didn't, and also provide pros and cons to people who are con contemplating how they're going to do it. Because I have absolutely trained on my own, and I've trained with a very competitive large group and everything in between. And each one of them have their pros and cons. Right. Yeah. So uh, I similar path when I graduated from uh, from college, you know, like I said before, I was not quite at the barely at the national level. I, I was NCAA All-American, but not really close to the Olympic A standard. So I was working a full time job as a mechanical engineer, like 50 hours a week, uh, trying my best to train. So looking back, I don't know how I did it compared to what I did later in my career. You know, I'd work 10 hours a day and then I'd drive to a strength and conditioning place or I would find some place to throw on my own or uh, I would train at Northeastern. I was currently in, in Boston. Um, so I was, you know, uh, always dreaming, always, uh, always contemplating how could I improve my situation? Uh, so that's when I read that quote from Jan Zelezny, you have to set up your, your life to achieve, achieve your dreams. And that's when I created my matrix of what do you need? I need training partners. I need better weather. I, I, I want to be able to throw outside. I need facilities. I need a good coach. Um, I need, I need time. Right. So I, you know, kept thinking and thinking. And finally the stars aligned. I was out in California, um, you know, at the USATF club nationals. And I met, you know, my future coach, Todd Reese, he was the 1996 Olympian. And he's like, Hey, I'm running a track club out here in mission Viejo. Why don't you come train with me? So I went to Raytheon, my uh, employer at the time and said, can I transfer to your San Diego facility? And can I work part-time? And they said, yes. And that was like the best day of my life. So at that point, my, my switch situation improved slightly. Uh, we were, I was training, you know, in parks, we were, you know, in Southern California training in local neighborhood, uh, racquetball courts, throwing medicine balls while people grill, were grilling in the, uh, in the area next to us. Uh, but I was making it work, right? I was still working 30 hours a week. I was doing tons of driving, driving up and down the California coast, uh, but it could be worse. Uh, I was able to improve over that year. I went from like being national class to, to getting into world class, you know, at 380 meters, the Olympic standard, um, and then was able to make the world championship team kind of training in that, uh, that you know, dynamic environment, um, you know, that maybe unstructured environment uh, up until 2009. And then I earned my spot at the training center. So I was able to go there now, have a little bit more professionalism, um, have so many more resources, a better training group. Um, and I kind of worked my way up like that. So yeah, I understand what it, it feels like to train after a long day in the dark at a park. And I also understand what it, train, under, what it means to train kind of at like a Rocky Ford Drago type facility where you have everything you could possibly want at the Olympic Training Center. Yeah, that was uh, very interesting to hear from both of you. Um, and I hope that it will be clear to those who are listening um, that there are many different types of training environments and uh, with commitment, um, you can be successful in many different places. Um, but it's also evidence um, how hard both of you worked over the course of very long careers and just um, how much was achieved. Um, I want to... Um, zoom in for a second on preparation. Um, so you've, you've talked a lot about what a typical 
day or a typical week would look like and some of the uh, different places you trained at. Um, but I'm curious as to what steps you took to make sure that you're prepared both mentally and physically um, when it was time to compete and whether there was a pre-meet routine of any kind. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes, so I'd say I took, I took a little bit of time figuring out what routine worked best for me because admittedly I was doing things on my own in the beginning and I didn't know what the options were to get things done. So I would just mimic this person. And when I figured, and I you know figured out that routine, I was like, okay, I like that. And then like um, customize it to myself. I'd say it wasn't until I got to the Olympic Training Center again, um, but that's not where the story ends. Uh, it wasn't until I got to the Olympic Training Center that I kind of admittedly said, you know, can someone help me create the routine that I'm craving? Because right now I'm kind of winging it. And I did get that help in creating a routine and I, and I really liked it. And I used that routine for the next two years. And then when I went to IMG, I asked, I asked the same exact question and my routine got even more in depth, even more thorough. I'm talking about from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed, but I needed that. So I needed that structure that might not be the way everyone else works, but I came to be okay. I thought I was weird for feeling like I needed every single moment of my life regimented out. I thought I was weird, but I was putting that on myself. Um, there were other people who felt that way as well. Um, but I didn't get into that until very end of my career. But that routine included when I woke up, um, what I ate for breakfast, how in the time I allotted myself to get to practice, the way in which I warmed up, the shoes that I wore to warm up, like every little bit was regimented, um, including you know how I cooled down. I actually had it written out like and laminated and I took it with me everywhere. It was very serious. I was very serious about this. Um, including the routine included bedtime, which I didn't, I didn't play about my bedtime and I don't play about my bedtime now. I'm very serious about my bedtime because I understand the benefit of being able to be refreshed, to wake up, to do good work. And nothing about my routine changed, whether it was practice or competition, because that's my routine. So I would accommodate it to, you know, my travel schedule. I wouldn't be ridiculous. Like I must do this. You know, if I can't do some certain things, I'd be fine with it. But I knew what the, the fully scripted routine was from wake up tonight to going to bed. Um, and if I had to make some amendments, I knew that I could do that. But um, then you don't have to think too much. Um, and I think Sean kind of you know, pointed on that earlier about his routine and the structure of recovery and practice. You don't have to think about that. Why do I need to waste my brain cells on all of that? I just need to, you know, work really hard at what I need to do. I shouldn't be distracted by those um, extraneous things. And I did not want that. And I got more and more comfortable with being adamant about that as I became a more mature athlete, because um, I guess I didn't feel confident enough to do that early on. Um, but yeah, routine was very important, regimented from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep and uh, stick with a lot of those things today, post-athletic life. Cool, I wish I could uh, balance Fumi and say, yeah, I didn't have that big of a plan. So you didn't have two like um, neurotic people uh, on your podcast. Uh, but yeah, I was a planner as well. Uh, and mine was really driven uh, from trial and error. I would typically mess up the first time that I went to a big event. So I remember my first NCAA championships didn't go well. So I learned, you know, what did I do wrong? What, what, what didn't work? And then I tried to fix it and then ended up, you know, placing higher uh, my next, my next few times. So I was always starting with the end in mind. How do I get to the competition with the right mental energy, the right physical energy, the right timing. So I would, you know, like, like Fumi, um, you know, have my, my daily micro schedule, the couple days before the meet of when was I going to visualize? Cause you know, at some point I would be visualizing too much and I'd be thinking too much. So I, when are the designated times that I'm going to think about javelin? What are my meals? What am I going to eat? Um, 
uh, you know, what am I going to think? Actually, you could see my plan for the 2016 Olympics. I, you know, I like to make stupid visuals for myself. I would plan out, you know, what is my mindset? And most of the time it was, ha ha ha, this movie is funny. So I can really give myself the mental energy to kind of take myself away uh, from the stress. So I don't want to be watching movies like, you know, 300 or, uh, or, you know, other action movies that you would typically think I got to get pumped up, right? So I would be watching cartoons or Disney movies just to keep that mental energy to save it for that flight or fight situation I was going to get into uh, with, with the competition. Yeah, so I, my, my pre-meet routine was, uh, was very big in it. Uh, very important to me. And it was always with the end goal of how do I get to that, that place that I need to be to perform, you know, the best. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you uh, for sharing that. I think it's very evident um, that it is important if you're going to perform at your very best, especially on the world-class stage, um, that you should find a routine that works for you and stick with it um, just to reserve that uh, physical and mental energy. Um, and just oh, maybe eliminate some of the extra thinking because you have a lot of steps already laid out beforehand. Um, one thing I'm really curious to hear more about is how you balanced your enjoyment of your sport. And I know you both talked about some innate enjoyment of your sport um, from the time you first started with also wanting to and needing to strive to meet the highest standards in the world. Uh, yeah, that, that's a tough one. I, I can't say that I perfected that while I was doing it in retrospect. Um, I can see how I could have handled some of that better. I found it very stressful. I love track and field. <laughs> I love track and field is my favorite sport on the, on the planet. I think it is the best sport on the planet. And so I love it, but there were times where I didn't love it. Um, and that's because I didn't balance things well. And now on the outside, older and, you know, retrospective, I can see how I could have done a better job, but um, I can't say that I, I cannot sit here and tell you that I did a good job with that because that's just, that's just not true. <laughs> I'll, I'll hear what Sean has to say. I, I can't, yeah. I can help I, people from my experience, but I, I didn't do a good job with that. Yeah, I think I just might have redefined enjoyment. I remember, you know, I talked to my college coach now and he's like, I remember, Sean, when you messed up at the NCAA meet, you wouldn't talk for a week. So I was pretty, uh, pretty grumpy when it yeah. came on my way. And as I got older, you know, that week turned into a day. It was still very painful. And I messed up at some big meets um, and it really hurt. And you would have flashbacks for the next few days of like, oh, is this really reality? Did that really just happen? Um, and it's super painful. But when I look back on those memories, it's not. It's that's what it feels like to go all in. Um, so it feels good. So I look back on even the worst memories and they're in, in enjoy it's enjoyment. So I think, you know, looking back, I would rather have my heart ripped out after I put my soul into it than to have not had the opportunity. So I think, um, you know, it's we're swimming in the deep end. Uh, it's fun to swim in the deep end. We're lucky to swim in the deep end to have that opportunity. And sometimes it doesn't go your way. Uh, in terms of results, but you can't control that. So I tried to, uh, at the end of my career, I started to realize, um, you know, that if you're not always going to get the success you want, but uh, putting it all in and, and, you know, laying it out there is what you really enjoy. All right. Yeah. Thank you uh, for sharing those reflections. Um, so our next set of questions, uh, somewhat similar, but it relates to resilience and overcoming obstacles. And I know, I think pretty much anyone who has participated in a sport, um, even at a lower level, um, knows what it's like to have to face an obstacle. And, you know, the recent um, COVID situation and the year following um, in and of itself, I think, was a major obstacle for a lot of athletes. Um, but I'd love to hear your perspective um, as some of the best athletes in the world is, um, on this topic. Um, so what was the biggest challenge or obstacle you faced in your career as an athlete and what helped you to overcome it? Um, <laughs> when I look back at any challenges or obstacles I had, most of them were self-imposed. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I tell you, 
um, time gives you so much clarity, you know, and um, yeah, a lot of my obstacles will self-impose, but I'd say one of the, the biggest obstacles, which I soon, which I quickly accepted, um, but it took a while for me to see was where my weaknesses are, <laughs> right? Like I did not really know where my weaknesses are. And um, I didn't really take criticism very well. I didn't take um, being redirected very well. I would have to always first deny it and then circle back around to accept it. And sometimes it wasn't like moments or even a day. It might be a long time before I was corrected and then accepted it and then made those changes. So I'd say the biggest challenge that I had to overcome was being able to take the criticism or redirection because sometimes it's not even criticism. It's just an analysis that doesn't, you know, it's not to your benefit. Um, so being able to take that redirection and criticism um, was probably my my biggest challenge. I spent a lot of time in the small groups that I was in, quickly going from being in that group to being the best in that group. And if you spend a lot of time, we're in a position where you're the best in your little small circle, you don't get told that you're not doing a great job very often. So when you move to a bigger group where you're not the better person, um, and someone's telling you that, hey, that's not right. You're not doing that right. You need to redirect it like this, or you need to do this, or you're actually not as fast as you think you are, Fumi. <laughs> you know, you really need to work on your speed. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm so fast. And it's like, okay, well, I had to deny it before I came back around to accept it and then do what I needed to do to correct it. Um, so my biggest obstacle was, was Fumi, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, Fumi, you, I have to start going first because you take all my answers. Um, all right, just, you go first on the next one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think I was very lucky as well where, you know, my biggest obstacle was, you know, between my ears. Um, you know, I was very fortunate to have such a strong support structure uh, with my family and friends um, where, you know, I had full support to, to go all in and pursue my dreams. Uh, and I think, you know, the, what was my big, biggest obstacle to success was wanting to force everything and make it happen immediately. I think turning it off for me. So whether it was injuries and, uh, and not being able to take the time off or back off, listen to my body when I knew I should, you want to do that extra rep, that extra practice. You're not confident that, okay, if I take some time off now, do plan B, it will come out better in the long run. Or if I take a step back, focus on this technique, um, it'll be better in the, in the long run. So just uh, not relinquishing, uh, you know, some of the control and trusting in the process, trusting in, the, in a coach. Uh, in hindsight, I think I could have done uh, a much better job uh, with that. Right, yeah, thank you both for sharing. Um, so our next question has to do with injuries. Um, but what keeps you motivated to continue training and continue pursuing your goals when you have a setback, specifically an injury? And what do you do on recovery days um, to prevent injury and also um, ensure a successful return to competition? Yeah, so I'll go quick. I'm sure our answers are going to be similar. But, you know, like I alluded to earlier, I think being proactive is key. So when we, at, you know, at the, at the Olympic Training Center, Olympic Training Center, I'm sure facilities and training groups all over, they're, we're moving to being more proactive. So doing types of screens to identify imbalances and weaknesses that you can improve to lower your probability of being injured. And then setting up protocols and training plans to assess those, uh, you know, separate to your performance enhancing workouts, even though these are actually performance enhancing because time on the field, you're going to get better when you're, when you're sitting you know, off the field um, of, of play, you know, it's hard to improve. Uh, that being said, I think what really helped me was it's always going to take a couple of days. The, the quicker you can accept the injury, diagnose the injury and understand, you know, what, you know, what is the recovery time look like and then accept plan B and get excited and passionate and, and enthusiastic about plan B, because there's always steps that you can take forward. Even if you can't do everything you want to do, you can't do the full workout. You can't do all your sprints, all your lifts or all your throws. You can do some subset. You can improve a weakness that you didn't want to focus on before. And once you do that, you can have the same enthusiasm about your recovery uh, 
moving back into a full competition, and then you'll actually be better uh, than when you left. Um, so for me, uh, when I had setbacks and I did have some pretty major setbacks, uh, the thing that would help me out the most was the fact that I love track and field. Like I loved it and I wanted to get back out there. So that's number one. Uh, number two was, for instance, I had, you know, pretty bad injury to my back and I couldn't train like I wanted to. And I had to make so many modifications and the things that I was really good at, which were power things. I was excellent at power and I love to show off. I couldn't do any of those things because I my back was terrible. So now I have to do things that I suck at. Are you kidding me? Like <laughs> That's so difficult. Um, but I loved a new challenge because sometimes um, in doing one skill repetitively, you do have to find new places to challenge yourself, like truly, truly challenge yourself. Yeah, you're trying to get better at what you're doing, but something that's like, whoa, this is challenging. That was me in rehab. And I, tr I treated rehab to my body like my full-time job. Like I was like, man, when I tell you I'm gonna rock the socks out of this rehab program today, I had to gas myself up to do clamshells. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I had to do that because I, I know that I needed to stay involved even though I couldn't express myself the way I wanted to with really powerful, aggressive movements. But I had to refocus my mind to be like, man, I'm about to be the world champion gold medalist of these clamshells today. I'm about to do this hip mobility like no one's ever done hip mobility before. Like I've talked to myself like that and people I am sure thought I was crazy, um, but I didn't care. And not only that, which I think we'll get to later, when you have setbacks, you need support. And I had and still have such an awesome group of friends who support me so fiercely and family who support me so fiercely. So setbacks require support. All right, yeah, thank you all both for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, so zooming in specifically on a meet that didn't go as well as hoped. And I know uh, for each of you, your bad results uh, is still significantly better than most people's lifetime best. Um, but that being said, if you have a meet that wasn't the result you're hoping for, how do you bounce back so that the subsequent meets um, reflect more what you know you're capable of? Yeah, I'll go first. Yeah. So, I mean, I had a lot of bad meets. I'm sure a lot of people do. And I kind of used, I used to have the mantra where I'll have one bad meet, but I won't have two bad meets in a row. So I think, uh, falling in love with the process. And if you can take, if you can start to change your mindset where it's less objective judgment, well, that was good or that was bad. Uh, I'm sorry, less uh, subjective and more objective assessment of that was, that technique um, had these attributes. Uh, I'm trying to have these attributes, right? So learn from that, learn from your mistakes. And then you're even more hyper-focused going into the next training session. So a lot of the worst meets were followed up by the best meets you use that bad competition as a huge learning experience motivation because maybe some people beat you that shouldn't have and you want to go really stick it to them next time and also maybe you're very embarrassed with your technique you think that you can represent yourself better so you're gonna you know have more to focus on and, and sometimes the hardest part is coming after a good coming back after a good meet to have another good meet right it's you need to take what am i learning from this good meet uh to to take myself uh up further Um, I'll say that I, it took me a long time to learn how to bounce back from a bad meet. I was a slow learner. Okay. Um, but it took me a long time to figure that out because I seemed very, um, concerned with what other people thought about my performances. And it took me a while to realize that it does not matter. Um, and then I came to the understanding that I know it's, controversial to say, but you're really only as good as your last meet. So, okay, the next meet might be a good meet, like Sean said, and no one's going to remember two meets ago when I was trash. Um, so you're really only as good as your last meet in my mind. Now there, are, you can go in depth in that, but in all honesty, you're not going to, you know, get, 
absolutely last in one meet and then the next meet win and people are going to be like yeah but she got absolutely last no one's going to do that and even if your mind if you've made yourself believe that someone's going to do that no one's going to do that and if they do it's not a very nice person so probably stop talking to them um but you know there, there's so much uh talk that we do to ourselves in our head about how we feel about it, how we feel other people feel about it, which is not even reality. Maybe how you feel about it is reality, but how other people are perceiving it, we put way too much credence into that. And half the time people don't even care, right? Um, especially if you already have a meet schedule that's laid out, they're not gonna disinvite you to the meet. You're already headed to your next competition, okay? So now you, you know you have an opportunity to do it there. Sometimes, maybe sometimes you don't know what your next meet is, but quieting the voice in your head about, oh my gosh, I did bad. All the people here know that I jumped, you know, five meters. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. They're actually really excited to see you. Um, and it took me a long time to get there because I didn't get it. And I was very emotional and very critical. Nobody was more critical about me than me. And that's when I realized I need to be gentle to myself because I tell people how I thought about what I did or my performance. And they'd be like, whoa, <laughs> ease up there. You're really doing way too much. And so I had to learn to honestly be gentle with myself, but it took a very long time for me to get there a very long time, but I can, I gotten there now. And I tell other people to be gentle with themselves where I wasn't able to, when I was doing it. Yeah. Thank you again uh, for sharing those insights. Um, Bumi, I know you mentioned, uh, the friends and family and you both mentioned, um, coaches and other support staff, but I was wondering if you could both comment on um, how some of those people surrounding you helped you to reach your fullest potential as an Olympic athlete. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I think it, it takes an army, right? I think my biggest supporter is my wife. Uh, Maddie. So she, we met in college at Dartmouth. She was a long jumper and a multi-eventer. Uh, she's like the most talented athlete in our family now. Um, but it was, I was so grateful for her. She was the one person that I would not be grumpy to after a bad competition. Like a lot of people would, uh, I just couldn't talk to them. Uh, they would always say the wrong thing, but with her, she always knew exactly what to say. Um, so her being a super aggressive athlete herself, it was just so great to have someone that was always there to talk to and always understood. She actually inspired me before so many uh, competitions. I think at the 2013 U.S. Championships, I was like in fifth and she was watching at, at Des Moines. I don't know if you've ever been there, but the javelin runway is surrounded by like a tall wall. She was standing on top of the wall. She just looked at me and said, hit a block. And I was like, all right. And I went down and threw a, my best throw and, uh, and got on the podium. Uh, so I think between her and my mother and then all of my, my training partners, javelin throwers are very close. Um, you know, we all just push each other and I couldn't have done it with, without all of all of those people. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I was extremely lucky. I think that's, you know, that's what kept me going. Yeah. Yeah, I I had such an amazing group of friends that <laughs> like it really seemed like everybody wanted me to do well. Like it really I, it really felt like everyone was like, we're, we're doing this together. We're in on this together. And um, I don't think I would have been nearly as successful if I didn't have that group of friends. Um, and also, I think part of it was my parents as well, both of whom are not athletes, don't necessarily even get track and field or anything like that, but it didn't matter because I didn't need them to analyze what I was doing on the track. I just needed them to be supportive. And my dad's like the most supportive person in the world. And it, none of it has to do with my actual performance. You know what I mean? He just knows that I'm excited about it. And so he's excited about it. And that's all I needed. Um, but I had an amazing amount of people around me who were consistently around me, um, who were my friends, some of whom, many of whom had already been there, had already been to Olympic games, had already been to world championships. And so they, we could have conversations where we really understood each other. If I wanted to talk to somebody about how I was feeling or the support I needed as an athlete, I could go to those people who had already been there and done that. Um, if I just needed the support and love of family, I knew where to go for that too. So 
I, I went to certain people for the certain needs that I had, but I had all of those needs. Um, I had all of those different resources there. And I think it's so important that people find their support group and like hold on to them tight because it's so, it's so important. It's so, I can't imagine doing any feat, whether it's athletics or something else. Like you have to have that support group, people who are like, look, I'm here for you. What do you need? I'm here for you. And I try to be that for my friends and for my, my student athletes, like, what do you need? I'm, I'm here. Cause I know how important it is, you know? And sometimes they don't even need anything. They just want to hear you say, it. and I'm like, bet I'm here, <laughs> you know, whatever you need. So yeah, I had a really good group of, of people around me. All right. Yeah. That was amazing to hear. And I know for everyone listening, uh, you probably think of those people uh, who are incredibly supportive of you on your athletic journey and definitely essential to your success. Um, so with the World Athletics Championships uh, beginning at the end of this week, I think it goes without saying that we want to know more about your experiences on the world stage. Um, so first thinking about the U.S. Championships, um, which is the meet you would compete in order to qualify for the World Championships and Olympics. Um, what was it like uh, to compete in this meet uh, vying for a spot on a world championship or Olympic team. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I, I competed in the, the U.S. championships. My first, uh, first goal was the 2004 Olympic trials, and then my last was the 2017 uh, U.S. championships. So I had a good run uh, of 13 chances to, uh, to figure it out. And, uh, and by the end, it was awesome. We were on U.S. soil. I knew my competitors. Uh, I, I had my routine, and I knew I was going to go in there and kick everyone's butt. Um, so it was, it was fun. Um, so I was so nervous, but I learned to really love that feeling of enjoyment. I used to say, uh, you know, early in my career, it was like I had Christmas presents under the Christmas tree, and I would just pick them up and shake them to see what was in there. Am I going to win? Am I going to make the team? And then by Christmas morning, the present would be destroyed. I'd be so tired from thinking about it and shaking that present that I'd have nothing left. But then I learned to leave the present alone under the tree, enjoy the feeling of nervousness, know that it's like my brain just trying to jump out of its skin because you've put in so much work and you don't know what's going to happen. So once I was able to let that wash over me and relax, it was so much energy. I remember going into like, you know, maybe my favorite is the 2015 U.S. Championships, buying for a spot in the 2015 U.S. Championship team. I threw my PR on the last throw. I was the Olympic A standard for 2016, but uh, I, I really felt like I had it dialed in. Um, for the U.S. championships at the end of my career. And I wish I could have carried that over to, you know, to the uh, uh, world stage, but we, maybe we can talk about that next. <laughs> um, for me, competing at U.S. champs to me was always the most stressful. It was more stressful than whatever you were competing to get on the, that Olympic team or that world championship team. I really feel that way. Um, to, uh, when I made the Olympic team in 2008, um, I had never been so nervous in my life and it was mind blowing. And I actually, I have this amazing ability to get so excited. I forget everything. I don't remember most of it. I don't remember it. I'm just like, I made the team. I don't remember it because I was just so excited and so nervous and everything. Right. Um, but I will say that I, I so envy Sean because it sounds like he evolved emotionally and mentally so well throughout his career. I did not. <laughs> I did not. I remained in, incredibly anxious for every world championships. Um, there are stories like really bad nervousness to being sick. Like I would get so nervous. Um, but making the team, there's honestly no better feeling. I imagine the better feeling is probably winning whatever it is that you're going to win. But for me, it was just amazing to be able to make those teams. And, you know, I was so grateful every single time. But, yeah, it, it was definitely, definitely a memorable experiences, especially 2008, because that was my first time um, being at U.S. Well, actually, that's not true. 
I was at USA's the year before and I think I didn't make the finals or something. And so then the next year I made the team, but also going forward because I was very much an underdog. I was like, I can't, I can't sleep on anybody here because I'm sure I upset a couple of people when I made the Olympic team, nobody was looking for me. There might be some girl from another small private university that I've never heard of <laughs> who's gonna come and take my spot. So you just really can never sleep at the USA. It's anybody can come and get your spot, anybody at any time. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing a little bit of insight on what it is like uh, to be at the US Championships and really vying um, to go to the Olympics or World Championships. Um, so I think I'll ask next about the World Championships um, and what some of those experiences were like for you. And then we'll uh, move on to the Olympics, kind of the grandest stage. Um, I know the World Championships are coming up next um, at the end of this week. Cool, I'll go first for World Championships and Fumi can go first for Olympics because uh, she's probably, uh, can't wait to tell us her 2008 story. So I guess my, uh, you know, I always struggled on that big stage to have the same mental approach um, and to come into that grand stage with full energy. I was always, you know, a little bit worn out from the, you know, the travel, uh, the, the village, and the pressure and the stress and the excitement. Um, the, the greatest experience I had was in 2009, and I was almost like tricked into having a good performance. I was lucky enough to make the final. Uh, but my first two throws in the, in the qualification round were, were garbage, right? I was just trying to muscle it. I couldn't relax and let my technique work. Then we had a rain delay. So we were sitting under the stadium, the Berlin Stadium, this magnificent beast of a stadium uh, for two hours. And I was watching all the competitors get really tired and start to lose confidence. And that made me think like, hey, these guys are getting nervous too. I was like, I'm going to take this opportunity. I'm not going to, I'm not going to just sit around and then give up on my last throw. Uh, so I was gaining momentum, gaining excitement. Then we go out to the stadium, get a couple warm up throws. I'm feeling really good. That was actually, uh, I think, later in the evening than expected Usain Bolt's running the 200. So there's like 60,000 people in this stadium. And it's like I have 3D uh, goggles on. Like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I'm on the runway about to go for my last throw. And then the American flag drops. It's like the national anthem is playing because Trey Hardy won the gold medal in the decathlon and I had to pause for the national anthem. So now my hair is just standing up on my arms. So I was actually tricked to get out of my own head. I like went into the zone. I didn't even count my steps in the approach. I was just thinking now it's time to show that the stand up for the USA. You can't, you can't have a throw with bad technique after they play the national anthem. I was so motivated. I ran down without even thinking I executed my cues and boom, I was 12, 11th going into the final through a season best. So that was like, what I wish I could do every time. I think that's maybe how you describe the zone, uh, but I was lucky enough to do that in, in the world. So that was like, that's my experience of being able to represent my country, my team and my family to the best extent possible. And I mean, it was an amazing feeling. Okay, my uh, <laughs> world championship experiences uh, were not that great. <laughs> Your story is riveting, mine is not. Um, in 2009, I didn't make the final, and I I think I fouled most of my jumps, um, and I was devastated, and I it, it just was not great. Um, and then in Daegu, like Korea, um, was I think I I think I made the final. No, I can't remember if I made the final in that one. It also wasn't good. When I tell you I, I had a long career and had some excellent performances, I I choked a lot at the championship level. Um, like I said, there are a lot of things I wish I knew then that I know now about performance and how to handle some of those things, but I didn't have it at that time. So I, I could get myself there, <laughs> but I didn't know how to, you know, capitalize on it once I got there. Probably my best showing actually was my last one, which was uh, Moscow in, I think 2014. Um, but there are just so many things that, that happen and that can distract you. Um, and while, while I heard Sean kind of like be happy to get out of his own head, I was always like, there's too much stimulation. I'm so confused. <laughs> you know, um, I remember Usain Bolt false starting in Korea and being distracted 
about that because I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy messed up at world championships. Like I'm thinking about this while I'm sitting, you know, at the long jump pit or also in Daegu, the little machine that like smooths out the sand got stuck in the middle of the sand. And now we're just waiting for this thing to move. And I'm thinking, why is it taking so long? Like I, I got so distracted. Um, making those teams was amazing. My execution was poor. Um, and at, at least at world championships. Um, but my Olympic story is probably a little bit different, but not too much different. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, that was the uh, next question. I think the Olympics um, are something that captivates so many people. And I think it's such a tremendous accomplishment uh, to to represent your country in the Olympics. Um, And I may be biased, but I think track and field is uh, the most impressive sport for a few different reasons. Um, And the U.S. is the toughest team to make. Um, I'd love to hear more about your Olympic experience, uh, your favorite memory, and then Perhaps if you could redo the experience, what might you do differently now? So my Olympic experience was just so crazy because mind you, when I made the team in 08, that was my first year on the professional circuit. Um, I had only had my first international meet maybe a couple of months prior to Olympic Games. Um, I was a tourist, man. I was a tourist. Like, I was just like, y'all let me do this. This is crazy. This is amazing. Like, I was just so enthralled with everything. <laughs> you know, I'm in China. Are you kidding me? About to jump in some sand. I was a tourist, man. I loved it. Not in the sense that I was touring the city, but I was just like, oh my God, I'm so enamored with stuff, right? And um, I was focused, I worked hard. I had a great group of people around me, uh, you know, but I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I made it to the final um, by the skin of my teeth and I definitely didn't have my best performances. But when I tell you I hadn't mastered my mind, that was my first time making a a US team. I never made anybody's junior team or other team prior to my Olympic team. The Olympic team was the first team that I ever made, period. And um, that's not, and I don't know, Sean, I think that might be a similar experience for you, but that's not the experience for a lot of people who end up going to Olympic Games. They've been to a world championship or a junior team. That was my first anything, period. I went to university, a small school, and then I went to Olympic Games. And I was like, holy smokes, I don't know what I'm doing, right? Um, But I think that I executed well in the, in the, um, in the prelim, I made it to the final and I couldn't believe it. And I just, <laughs> I think I fell apart a little bit, but, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely to this day, the best moment of my life, best time of my life. I can't really even pick one moment out. That is the best opening ceremonies hands down from any Olympic games period. There's, is not a conversation or communication. It is, it's the best opening ceremonies period. It was the best time of my life. I just, oh my God, I loved it. It was just so amazing. Um, I can't pick one thing out. The whole thing was amazing. It really was best opening ceremonies. I dare you to tell me another one that's better. <laughs> Go ahead, Sean. Cool. Yeah. So um, that's awesome. My, uh, you know, my Olympic experience, I think, so the first thing it's different, it's the same thing, right? It's the world coming together uh, to compete, except if there's every other sport. So it's the same, but it's absolutely different uh, because the whole world is like, you're on the Olympic team. So when I was on the world championship team, no one talked to me, right? So there's so much less family pressure, friend pressure. Uh, No one's asking for tickets to go to the Berlin world championships. Uh, But then now you're an Olympian and it's a huge deal. So I had a little bit of stress because, you know, my mindset, and this might be something that would have changed was I'm going to treat this like any other meet, right? We're going to have the same strategy. We're going to go in there, same routine, and we're not going to make this a big deal. But that kind of but it heads with how my family was treating it. So then I spent more time explaining how this was the same uh, 
it to them and then being frustrated. Well, you have to enjoy your, your experience. Uh, so that caused a little bit of stress. So I think it is different because the whole world really loves it. And I would have, I would like to have understood that and maybe, you know, humored my family and friends a little bit more instead of trying to shove my philosophy down their throat. You know, second is, you know, I showed up to the village late, like it's the shortest time in 2012 and 2016, I needed to recover. Uh, so I didn't do the opening ceremonies in either. It's like, I'm going to train up until the last moment and I'm going to do my best. I'm going to set myself up because my dream is to throw my personal best in the qualifying and then do my personal best in the, uh, in the final. And how can I set that up with this structure? Uh, so then what happens? I go there, you know, your plan isn't going to plan. The, the coolest thing about the Olympics, it's like a human zoo. You're walking around the village. You see people of all shapes and sizes. It's amazing. And, and uh, you get to meet all these friends. Um, so there's all of this cool stuff going on. There's all this excitement in the village. There's just TVs everywhere. And you're seeing adrenaline plaque performances. So like, how can you stay calm? You can't. Um, so I showed up to every Olympic Games flat with, with the, without the energy. Uh, and I think in hindsight, I would have just went with the flow. I would have showed up to the village when everybody else did, gone done the opening ceremonies and not been so structured. Uh, and maybe that would have helped me relax so that it could have a little bit uh, more energy. But, you know, I, I I'm not disappointed with what I did. You know, I had a strategy. I stuck to my guns. Um, it didn't quite work. Uh, so I told like this hair raising story about 2009. You know, the opposite, opposite happened in 2012 you know, with Trey Hardy as well. He was my roommate in the village. Again, he wins like uh, the gold medal or maybe it was a silver medal, but he won a medal. And then we're both walking out of the village the day after. I had just got like last in the qualifying and he had just won a medal. I'm walking to go see my friends and uh, with my tail between my legs and he's walking to go get interviewed by Good Morning America. And I remember that was like the first time where I had like some serious emotion. It was like, oh, wow, this is terrible. And that really hurt. But looking back, that's like a hilarious, like very great memory. Like we, it just shows the difference. Um, you're both feeling strong emotions. It's just opposite ends of the spectrum. So uh, there's my, uh, my take on it. Yeah, yeah, thank you uh, for sharing those Olympic experiences. Um, you're thinking later in this week um, when we have our top American athletes and then also top athletes from all over the world competing at the World Track and Fields our world athletics championships. Um, what advice would you give to someone um, who's about to compete in those world championships? Okay, sorry, I'll go. Um, the advice that I give any younger athlete, no matter where they are, or what they're trying to pursue is do not rest in the things that you are good at. And I find a lot of people want to rest in the things that they are good at. Um, the most important thing to do is to make sure that you're trying to sharpen the things that you're not good at. Even if you consider that I'm really great at this and this one doesn't matter as much. I'm not that great. So I'm not going to work on it. No, work on that thing. That's the thing that you should work on. Um, I find too many people, including myself, who only want to ever shine who are scared or embarrassed or whatever of not being perfect all the time or not, yeah, not being perfect all the time. And like in the process of becoming your best you, it's not gonna always be beautiful. Every practice is not going to be fantastic. You will make mistakes. And if you don't make mistakes, you're doing it wrong. You're absolutely doing it wrong. Um, so my advice is to allow yourself to make those mistakes, put yourself in positions where it is good. This could be difficult. This, this, whatever my coach is asking me to execute could be difficult. And I might even look goofy doing it, you know, so what, um, put yourself in those uncomfortable situations so that you can really challenge yourself. And the more you do that, the less you will be shaken by things. Um, so yeah, I think my biggest advice is to, um, you know, get uncomfortable, I guess. Um, but as far as world championships specifically, um, to someone who's competing at world championships specifically, is like I said earlier, man, relax and win. That is really that simple because you're not about to do anything different at world championships that you haven't done all year. So the only thing that you can do is relax and execute what you already know how to do. That's the only thing you're supposed to do once you get there. 
All right. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm not even going to pretend like and try to come up with a different answer, but mine was also relaxed. Uh, and I, I do love Bob Winter's book. Um, I was, you know, when I talked to uh, my kids about javelin technique, you know, the faster you run, the more you have to focus on your positions because you have less time to, to, uh, to fix issues, right? So you have to be in good position to take care of all of that extra energy. It's the same with world championships. When there's so much adrenaline, you can't think your way through it. So what happens to me, and I know this happens to a lot of people, it goes by so fast, right? You, you finish, you had, you finish your three throws and it's done and you didn't execute any of your cues. You're like, what the heck just happened? Right? So you need to relax. You need to have focus. Uh, so it's the same thing that, that Fumi said. And it's really, it, uh, I think maybe because we're, we're field eventers and we have three chances with something that, that's super fast. Uh, so in order to channel all of that adrenaline, maximum relaxation, understand what your cues are, get out of the moment, get out of your head, be in the present moment so that you can have leave the world championships knowing that I executed, you know, my technique on my attempts and gave it my best. I didn't just let the energy of the moment blast me through. And it's like, I don't even remember what happened. So, you know, you need to relax. You need to be very focused uh, and get out of your own head. Um, and I wish I had done that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so last question is very similar, um, but thinking a little bit more generally, um, what advice would you give to a younger athlete who wants to reach the highest level they can in their sport, um, whatever that level may be and whatever that athlete may be pursuing? Yeah, I think I kind of addressed this in my, in my last comments um, about just, you know, trying to execute and practice the things that you're not good at. I think that's so important. Um, and, and, you know, get uncomfortable and practice and be conscientious about the things that you're doing. Um, I think early on, I was just a good talent. So I wasn't really conscientious about anything I was doing. I was just like, I'm gonna go out here and wing it and winging it ended up working for me a lot. Um, and people let me get away with that. I don't respect that. Um, I, I much rather respect someone be like, you're a good athlete. You could wing it, but how about you perfect it? <laughs> you know, I would have respected that a little bit more. So for people who find themselves to be, you know, naturally good at something, man, find a way to be excellent at something, find a way to be precise in your movements and what you're doing. Um, and, uh, probably my last ed bit of advice would be, uh, man, listen to your coaches. <laughs> I, I hear, I just, I listened to my coaches. I'm not gonna lie. Like I was very much a rule follower and I listened to my coaches. And, um, I, I just think that a lot of young athletes need to listen to their coaches, especially if their coaches have good practical experience as well. Um, listen to your coach. That's all. <laughs> I would just say, believe in yourself, right? So you, you need to be your own advocate. Um, if you believe in yourself, then you'll find a way, leave no stone unturned. Uh, for me, it was always find a, finding a strategic way. The more information I, I knew and I gathered, um, the more belief it fostered. Uh, but I think you know, you're always gonna have to uh, rely on, on your belief that you know you can do it uh, and be enthusiastic about that, about that process. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so one last little thing just out of curiosity, um, but what do you enjoy doing when you are or when you are not um, excelling at your sport? And then is there anything in particular um, that you are pursuing right now? Oh, yeah. So uh, when I was, you know, I love the outdoors. I love action sports uh when i was young surfing snowboarding uh you know all, all sports when i was training i kind of had to put that all on the back burner uh, now i have two little kids so it's so fun to take up some of my own uh old hobbies um so i love doing all things out, outdoors you know currently i'm trying uh you know i'm transitioning from mechanical engineering trying to take that strategic mindset uh that structure and Put it into the coaching world so i'm starting my own little uh small business coaching uh people trying to create content to help you know educate coaches about javelin technique and i want to expand that because i just love uh you know all of the stones that i turned over in my career whether it was sports psychology 
nutrition, training, and I want to read more, learn more, and then, you know, teach people, catch people when they were younger than I learned it uh, to try to see if they can, you know, uh, use it better and, and get higher to where, to, to where I went. Um, now that I'm retired, I, uh, I actually stayed in the sport pretty, you know, early in my retirement coaching at the university level and whatnot. And then I was like, it's too much. So I stepped away from that completely. And I was like, I'm done with track, whatever. It's probably a big emotional thing. You know, I think we, a lot of us go through it, but then I was like, Oh, I'm not as happy as I used to be. Um, what, what was what was I doing when I was the happiest? And honestly, I love track and field. I think I've said that a hundred million times because it's true. Um, I also enjoy teaching. Um, so I still coach. I do have also a small business where I coach um, athletes in most technique events, not on the field, not, I mean, not in the throws. Um, so like hurdles, um, long jump, high jump, triple jump. That's where I like to live. Um, as far as coaching is concerned, because it makes me happy. I love being outside. I love three o'clock in the afternoon and it's hot and I live in Texas and you know, like it's practice time. Like that is my favorite time of the day because that's practice time. Right. Well, not for everyone, but I, I love that. So I stay involved in, in coaching in that way. Um, mentoring people who are trying to become, you know, post-collegiate athletes and, and make it to the places that I've been and make sure that, you know, the same way that people poured into me who had been there before, that I, I make myself available to those who are now coming into the same place that I just left and giving them resources that I previously got from other people or just, you know, any kind of instruction or even just an ear anything like that, because I know how important it is. Um, so I, I stay involved in track and field like that. Other than that, I, I work a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, I co-own one, one business and I do some legal recruiting as well. So I'm always pretty busy. And I think that the balance matters. Like I get to have my outlet of sport and track and field. Um, but then I also get to build a business, which I'm super proud of and uh, hope to build more in the future, quite frankly. So, and spend time with my family, which I didn't get to do as much as I would have liked for the eight years that I was on the circuit. So a lot of, a lot of this has felt like making up for lost time. All right, yeah. So thank you both uh, for sharing all of your time and experiences with us throughout the evening. Um, and I know I speak for a lot of people who are here right now and who will eventually view this when I say, that I enjoyed and learned a lot from both of you. Um, and I also want to remind all of those who are listening uh, to tune into the World Athletics Championship. So you'll see athletes in the women's long jump and men's javelin and many other events uh, who had a lot of these same experiences. Um, and that will be starting this Friday, uh, the 15th of July, and then going uh, through next Sunday, the 24th of July, on NBC. So I think that um, those world championships will be a tremendous opportunity to enjoy um, and keep learning more about our sport. Um, thank you again to both of you. Um, loved learning from you. Had a lot of fun this evening. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. That was great. Thanks, Fumi. Thank you, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Fumi. Thank you for being uh, human with us for ninety minutes. That was uh, that was great. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's lots so of, powerful. Lots for of gems. So yeah, just to see um, how human it is, even when you are one of the very best in the world. Um, I think there's a lot that a lot of people can relate to and learn from.